Hello, and welcome to the 741 channel. Thank you for stopping by. Today we're going to take a look at setting up the RSP Duo from SDR Play to receive amateur radio APRS data. So before we get started with the software setup, let's take a look at the hardware. First up, you can see I've got the RSP Duo here on the desk, and I've got an antenna connected through an SMA to SO239 adapter, and then out through the coax up to the antenna, which is a Bozak 2 meter antenna, and it's mounted up on the side of my garage, as you can see here. And then I've got the RSP Duo connected with a USB cable to my PC here, which is an older HP, which is running an AMD quad-core Phenom processor. I've got the RSP Duo hooked up and ready to go. Now it's time to figure out what we're going to use for software here. The first thing that we're going to need is we're going to need a piece of software that takes the place of a hardware TNC. Now if you're new to packet radio and APRS, a TNC is sort of like a modem, an old style modem, that would connect between your computer and your radio. Nowadays there are pieces of software that you can download that emulate the function of a TNC, so you don't need the hardware. Now the piece of software that I'm going to use in this video is something called Direwolf. Now you can see I've navigated to the repository where the download for that software is. You can see it's a GitHub repository. The URL is up at the top of the screen. There's also a link down in the description below if you want to click on that to get to the download. But anyway, as of October of 2018 when this video was put together, version 1.5 was the latest release. So the next piece of software that I'm going to download is the APRS application. And you can see that for this video, I'm going to use something called Pinpoint APRS. The URL is up here at the top of the screen, and there'll also be a link down in the description. So as far as I know, as of October of 2018, this is the newest APRS client that is available, at least for Windows. So I first learned about Pinpoint APRS by reading an article in the September 2018 edition of ARRL's QST magazine. So if you want an in-depth read on this application, you can read that article if you have access to the QST archive. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and go to the download page here, and I'm going to click the download button here, and I will download Pinpoint APRS and get that installed. So let's open up a file explorer and take a look at my downloads folder. You can see here I've got two zip files. The first is the direwolf zip file, and the second one is the pinpoint APRS zip file. So the first thing that I'm going to do is unzip the direwolf zip file. I'm just going to do extract all and let it extract here into the download folder. Now you may want to create a separate folder on your C drive for this because Direwolf is sort of an old school program. It doesn't have an installer like most modern applications. You basically unzip it to a folder and that's where you run it from. But for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to leave it here in downloads. So as you can see, we now have an uncompressed folder here for Direwolf version 1.5. And like I said before, you can leave this in downloads or you can move it to somewhere in your C drive or, or wherever you want. And I'm going to set up and, and install the Pinpoint APRS software. So the first thing that I'll do here is extract this zip file here into the downloads folder. So to get started with installing Pinpoint APRS, I'm just going to double click the setup application. Okay, so at this first screen, I'm just going to click Next. So at this step, I'm going to let it install into the default installation folder, and I'm going to let it install for everyone on this computer, even though there's only one account on here just for me. And then now I will confirm the installation. So now we'll just hit Next at this window, and the installation should start. Okay, that's pretty much it. Quick and easy. So I'll close this out. Now, I almost forgot, there's one other piece of software that we're going to need to make everything work, and that is a virtual audio cable. Now, the purpose of that application is to redirect audio from an application like SDR Uno and pipe it to another application. And this works in the same way that an audio cable on a stereo system would route, say, audio from a CD player to an amplifier. 
So for the purposes of this video, I'm using a program called VB Audio Cable, and you can find a link to that down in the description below. For this video, I'm not going to go through the installation and setup of VB Audio Cable. There's plenty of other videos out there on the internet that you can use for that if you need help getting it set up. So the last piece of software that we're going to need to make this work is the SDR application. Now in my case, I've already got SDR Uno installed on my computer. And if you need to see that process, I'll have links down in the description below to some of the videos I've made detailing that process. But anyway, at this point, as I've already shown previously in the video, I've got the RSP Duo connected and ready to go. So I'm just going to launch SDR Uno. For the purposes of this video, I've got SDR Uno set up to run the RSP Duo in single receiver mode. I've got the decimation set down to 16 just to minimize the CPU usage here because I've got my screen capture program running at the same time. And then over here, I've got the 50 ohm port of Tuner 2 active because that's where I happen to have my antenna plugged in. Okay, so over here in the RX control window, you can see that I've already tuned the radio to 144.390 in the 2 meter ham band. I've got my mode set to FM and I've got my filter set to 12K, which should be more than sufficient for this. And then the last thing that we need to set up here before we turn on SDR Uno is to redirect the audio output to the virtual audio cable that I have installed. To do that, I'm going to click on this settings button up here in the upper left corner. And then I'm going to go to the out tab. And then over here, I'm going to change my VME output device from the speakers, which it normally would be defaulted to, to cable input of the VB Audio app. Once I've got that set, I can close the window and then we can hit the play button to get SDR Uno started. So now at this point, we can't hear any audio, but you can see activity over here in the waterfall. So as you can see, there was a short packet burst there. That's sort of what it looks like in the spectrum display and waterfall. Now, of course, the audio is piped through to VB audio cable, so we can't hear anything at this point, but we can see that it's working. So at this point, let's launch Direwolf. Now, I'm going to launch this just to show you guys a couple of things, knowing that it's not going to work just yet. So you can see here that Direwolf has launched in a terminal window, and it's giving us some options here that we can set. Now, the first one and the one of interest for this project is setting up the input device for receive. You can see here that we have three options. So the first option here is the microphone. The second option is the VB audio cable and two is internal record. Now this option here, option number one, is the virtual audio cable that we've set up to use with SDR Uno. So you can see here in my case, I'm also getting an error. This is a bind failed with error 10048. And then down here it says that some other application is probably already using port 8001. So what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to change the audio input to the virtual audio cable and then I need to find the setting for this port and change it to another number. So I'm going to close down Direwolf and I'm going to go ahead and open the Direwolf configuration file here. And we're just going to open this in WordPad. So what I'm going to do now is scroll down to the audio input section. So you can see here it gives us some examples and a few clues on how to set this up. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uncomment this line here that says A device three and four, and I'm gonna just change this to A device one, noting that device one on the Direwolf instance when we first opened it was the virtual audio cable. Next up, I'm gonna scroll down and find that port setting that I need to change. And that happens to be down here under the virtual TNC server properties section. And in particular, you can see it's the KISS port 8001. Now we are definitely going to need this later on and I'll explain that when we get to the step. But for now I'm just going to change it to 8002. So that should be it. I'm just going to save this file. I'm going to close out of it and we'll start Direwolf back up. Okay, so as you can see Direwolf is up and running. We have the asterisk next to number one for the virtual audio cable and we don't have any errors down here. And now, as you can see, it is receiving data from SDR Uno and displaying it here in the terminal window. So this is the first station that we've received here so far. 
So what I'll do now is I'll bring SDR Uno back up and we'll put it alongside the Dire Wolf terminal window so you guys can kind of see the correlation between activity in the waterfall and what we're seeing in the terminal screen. Okay, so just there you saw a blip of activity over there in the spectrum display and we have a new entry over here in the terminal one. So now that we have SDR Uno running and we know that it is piping audio over here to Direwolf and Direwolf is properly decoding the packets, let's open up Pinpoint APRS and get that working with Direwolf. So now let's get Pinpoint APRS up and running. I don't use desktop icons, so I'm gonna go to the start menu and I'm gonna search for it. And you can see there it is. So we'll click that to get it started. You can see here for the first time running it, I have an end user license. I'm going to accept that. And let's see, now it's giving us a welcome message and some instructions on setting up the options. So I'm going to say OK. And you can see here we are presented with the options window. So let's go ahead and set some of this stuff up. Now under the APRS tab here, um, if you were planning on using Pinpoint APRS for transmitting, you'd want to set up your call sign and your path and all that sort of a thing. But because I'm not going to be using this for transmitting, I'm only going to be using it for receiving at this point, I'm not going to worry about setting any of that stuff up. I'm going to go right over to the TNC tab here. So up here under TNC type, I'm going to click the pull down and I'm going to change this over to network KISS mode. Now this is where that port setting that we changed from 8001 to 8002 inside of Direwolf will come into play. So I'm going to pick that KISS mode. We're going to ignore all these options in the middle for a serial TNC and go down to the network KISS TNC settings. I'm going to leave the TCP IP address at the loopback address of 127.0.0.1 and I'm going to change my port over to 8002 to match the setting inside Dire Wolf. I'm going to go back under the GPS tab here and I'm going to put in a rough latitude and longitude for my location so that when the map starts up, it starts up centered on this location. And just for fun, I'm also going to enter in an elevation. Now I'll click over to the map tab. Now you can pause the video here and read through these options if you'd like. I'm going to leave all these on the default setting and make a note that we are going to use Google Maps for this. But there are some other options that you can choose here if you prefer not to use Google Maps. Over here under the APRS IS tab, we can set up some settings for reporting our information back up to the IPRS Internet Gateway. So I'm just going to leave everything at default. And then under the miscellaneous tab, same thing. I'm just going to leave all of these options set to default. OK, so I think I'm happy with these settings. I'm going to click OK. And it looks like it wants me to put a call sign in on the tab. So let's see what we can do here with that. Let's see if it lets me just put in 741. And it did. So let's zoom in a few clicks here just so we get a better view of the general area and we'll get started. Okay, and now to get everything running, we need to go up under tools and connect TNC. You can see down here in the status bar, it shows that TNC is connected. So we should start receiving data here on the map and there is our first station, N1DWM. So as you can see and hear, Every time Dire Wolf decodes a packet here, it will throw up a station on the map if it's able to decode the latitude and longitude. Okay, so what I'll do now is I'll let this sit for a few minutes. I'll let the map fill in a little bit so you guys get a sample of what type of traffic and how much of it that I'm seeing here at my location. And I'll add that it is a rainy October night here in 2018. So I've had this running for about an hour and you can see the activity on the map here. Now this is a little interesting to me as I am located approximately here where the green pin is and all of the stations that I'm hearing are east and south of me. Not hearing anything to the north and I'm not hearing anything to the west. Now I'm not entirely surprised I'm not hearing anything to the west because there is sort of a ridge line directly to the west of my house that kind of block some of the VHF signals that I get from that direction. But I am surprised I'm not hearing anything from the north and kind of this area due south of me 
in the Manchester, Connecticut area. Now I'm probably only hearing a few of these digipeters directly, probably this one being the closest, and I think I've seen this one here, the Econ CT1 pop up. Okay, so if I zoom out a little bit, it looks like we are getting a little bit of activity coming through probably some of these digipeters. You can see we've got K1FFK up here now, up on uh, top of Mount Greylock, the highest point in Massachusetts. And that's probably getting me some of this stuff here. Again, I'm a little surprised I'm not hearing anything in this area, but maybe if I sit here longer, some of this stuff will fill in. It is kind of a rainy, cloudy night out there, so maybe propagation is down a little bit. So one other thing that I can do here is I can go under Tools and I can connect to the APRS IS system. Now in simple terms, this is basically a connection to the internet APRS backbone. And if we turn this on, some of these dead spots over here are gonna start to fill in with internet data. So you can see here, I'm just gonna click that to turn it on. And you can see down here at the bottom status bar, we're now connected to the APRS IS server T2 SJC. So let's let this sit here for a little while with the APRS IS connection and see if the map fills in a little bit. I've let this run for a little while and as you can see it's filled in a little bit up here in the Springfield, Massachusetts area. And then there's one station over here in western Connecticut but I'm still not seeing a whole lot over that direction. So let's take a quick look at the last herd window. And this is set up in sort of a tree fashion and you can expand and contract as needed. So the first thing that I'll do is open up the APRS IS report. You can see that under there, there are three categories, miscellaneous reports, position reports, and weather reports. If I expand miscellaneous reports, you can see all the call signs under that category. And then we'll just pick the first one. We can expand that and you can see sort of the raw tabulated data that was passed by that station. Now I won't get into all of this. It's beyond the scope of this video, but We'll minimize this and then we'll take a look. So under position reports, we kind of have the same thing, but these are stations that are just reporting their positions. We'll pick one at random here and you can kind of see what's going on. Some raw data about the packet that was sent. And then here under weather reports, if I expand this out, you can see the weather stations. I'll expand one and you can see the raw data for that particular weather station. If I expand out messages, you can see there isn't anything here. APRS does have sort of a simple messaging system that you can use to send messages from one station to another. And there haven't been any reported here, so we'll move on. Under here, we do have one packet error. Let's expand that out and see what it is. You can see there must be some sort of a problem here with the way that this particular packet was formatted. Now I'll expand out radio reports. Now before I do that, I wanna back up a second and just mention that the APRS IS reports are the reports that I'm getting over the internet through that APR IS gateway that we're connected to. The reports listed here under the radio reports, these are the ones that I'm hearing directly over the air. So again, we have miscellaneous reports from these stations, and then we have position reports from all of these stations, and then we have weather reports from these stations here. So one thing to just mention is that I'm not directly hearing all of these stations. Many of these stations are being rebroadcast re through a digipeter that I can hear. So for example, this Econ CT is one station that I know that I'm hearing directly. And it's up on a hill and it's probably hearing a lot of these stations that are over here in this area and into Rhode Island and then it's retransmitting their position reports to me, and then they're showing up over here in this list. So I think that's pretty much gonna wrap things up for getting APRS running on the RSP Duo. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to leave a comment or subscribe, feel free to do that as well. Thanks for watching.